Christians have been debating Genesis 1 for ages. While there are countless theories, the two major competing sides can be summed up as young earth creationists and old earth creationists. The former generally believe that the earth's age is somewhere between 6,000 to 8,000 and even 10,000 years old, and the latter believe that the age ranges somewhere around 4.5 billion years. Some believe God miraculously created everything in six days, resting on the seventh. Others believe the story is not meant to be taken so literally, and that God directed evolution over billions of years until man finally came to be. I'm not sure how old the earth is, but I am certain we did not evolve from apes, fish, or amoebas. However, there is another view that is not often spoke of and it refers to Genesis 1 as a prophecy, predicting the entire course of mankind until the end. I find it interesting, which is why I wanted to share it with you and see what you thought. Now this prophecy doesn't negate either argument for earth's age, rather, it's similar to other common threads in the Bible where we have an actual event occurring, but that event is either a shadow of something to come or a type. In fact, the Old Testament often displays types of Christs or prophetic events like Abraham and Isaac at the altar, which foreshadow the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, what do I think of this prophetic view of Genesis? Well, you'll have to wait till the end to hear my conclusion and to see the most convincing evidence that ties this all together. But first, the first clue we get that Genesis might be a prophecy comes from Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 and 10, which states, I am God and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My plan will take place, for I will do all my will. If that's to be taken at face value, then perhaps there's a prophetic clue about the future in Genesis, the absolute beginning, like Isaiah 46 just said. And indeed there is. In fact, they turn to the six-day creation story, stating that each day within the story represents an age of a thousand years, or a millennium, for a total of seven thousand years until the end of mankind as we know it. In fact, this prophecy theory has been pushed by some very influential historical figures in the church, including the famous 2nd century Greek bishop Saint Irenaeus, who said when referring to Genesis chapter 2 verse 2, this is an account of the things formerly created, as also it is a prophecy of what is to come. For the day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the six thousand year. Why each day for a thousand years? In 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8 it says, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. It all seems pretty bizarre on the face of it. I mean, how could anyone come up with such a theory? Well, according to proponents of this theory, they didn't come up with it, but rather uncovered it in the words of Genesis 1. You see, each day within the creation story has a prophecy built into it predicting major events that will unfold one event each millennium to show that the author, God, is making known the end from the beginning. So let's dive into this theory. On day one, the text reads, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. The first clue lies in the phrase, God divided the light from the darkness. What happened in the first 1,000 years that could relate to this? Well, we know from scripture that God calls the light good and darkness evil. For example, Jesus said in John chapter 3 verses 19 and 20, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. In this regard, the biggest thing to take place in the first 1,000 years or first millennium, according to the Bible, was the fall of man, as recorded in Genesis when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God's command to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God told them in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And they did spiritually die that day when their eyes were open, and for the first time in their lives, they knew the difference between good, or light, and what was evil, darkness. Later in Genesis, God says, Behold, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. You see, this was the moment when the light of God was pulled back from man, revealing the darkness of sin that had not existed prior to the fall of man. It was a prophecy foretelling good and evil would be divided sometime during Earth's 1,000 year, and that's exactly what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. Moving on to day two, the text reads, and God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. 
And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. It is believed in this passage that God told of Noah's flood. As it reads, let there be an expanse, or sky, in the midst of the waters. Proponents of this theory believe that before Noah's day, the sky had never seen rain, the earth was watered by a mist coming up from the ground. Many also say that the earth was covered by a watery canopy, protecting it from the harmful rays of the sun, which is one of the reasons why humans live longer in biblical times, until the waters came down during the flood. Despite the criticisms with this theory, cosmologists at NASA recently discovered an Earth-like planet that indeed has an atmosphere with water vapor, just like the Earth may have had at one time. But at the time of the flood, the Bible says the fountains of the deep broke open and spewed water high into the air which fell as rain. As a result, the sky surrounding Earth was in the midst of the waters for the first time ever during Noah's flood. And immediately following the flood, Earth's water was divided by the clouds above and oceans below. Now, according to the biblical timeline, Noah was born in the year 1056, and the flood occurred 600 years later, in 1656, taking place on the Earth's second 1000 year age, or second millennium. But why would God choose this event to prophesy? Well, like all events in this prophetic calendar, they all point to God's redemption and salvation. We're told by Jesus that the second coming of Christ in the end times will be like the days of Noah. Matthew chapter 24 verses 37 through 39 reads, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now according to Genesis, Noah was 600 years old when his family entered the ark. And the story says that God shut the door. Likewise, it is prophesied that God will shut the door to salvation on the day that Christ returns. While I believe the story of the flood historically happened, it was a picture of the return of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Just like Noah's family rises up into the air to safety as the world perished below, this foretells the day when Jesus' family will rise up into the air in the catching away to safety to meet him in the clouds as the world again perishes below, but this time by fire. Now this brings us to the third day of creation which reads, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. This, according to the theory, prophesied the parting of the Red Sea event, which took place on earth's third millennium in the year 2638, according to biblical calculations. If you remember, this is the story where the Israelites were freed from Egypt and were on the run from Pharaoh and his army. Moses and the Israelites approached the Red Sea and couldn't cross, so Moses stretched out his arms and the Red Sea parted. This is the event where the Israelites passed over to freedom and Pharaoh and his army perished in the water. The clue is in the line, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. These words foretold the parting of the Red Sea because during the event the waters of the Red Sea were gathered together and the dry land appeared. Exodus reads, And Moses stretched out his arm over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And again in Exodus chapter 15 verse 8 it reads, And with the blast of thy nostrils the waters were gathered together, the flood stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. What's interesting is in the words the waters were gathered together are the same in the creation account as they are in the Exodus account. This is obviously a major event in the history of Israel, but God chose to prophesy the event because the picture of Moses stretching out his arms at the Red Sea was again a picture pointing to Christ's death, which would take place in Earth's fourth millennium, or 4,000th year. So just like the story of Noah is a prophetic parable about Christ's second coming, so too the story of Moses is a prophetic parable about Christ's first coming. That brings us to day four in the prophecy. Genesis chapter 1 verse 16 reads, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. 
The key point here is the two great lights, the greater and the lesser. In the 7,000 year prophetic calendar, the most important events to take place during the fourth millennium was the ministries of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. They were both born around the year 3,967 and both died before the year 4,000. The Bible refers to John the Baptist and Jesus as lights, but points out that Jesus' light was greater than John's, mirroring the words of the Day 4 account in Genesis. John chapter 18 verse 12 reads, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Also in John chapter 5 verses 33 through 36 it reads, You have sent unto John the Baptist, and he has borne witness to the truth. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. And again in John chapter 1 verses 8 and 9 it says, He, meaning John the Baptist, was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. That, referring to Jesus, was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He, Jesus, must become greater. I, John the Baptist, must become less. According to this theory, Jesus was the greater light, pictured as the sun, whereas John the Baptist was the lesser light, pictured as the moon. And just like the sun is a true light source, and the moon only reflects the sun's light, this is exactly the picture the Bible paints comparing Jesus and John. John was not the light. He merely bore witness of Jesus' light, like the moon does of the sun. But there are also other clues that may provide witness to this conclusion. One example used is also in the creation story. God did not create the breath of life until after the fourth day, on days five and six, hinting to the fact that mankind would be dead in his sins for four days, or four thousand years, according to Peter's thousand years to a day passage, which says a day for God is as a thousand years. Now that brings us to day five. Genesis chapter one verse twenty reads, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that have life. According to the theory, the most important event to occur during the 7,000-year prophetic calendar's fifth millennium, which would fall between 4,000 and 5,000 years, was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and according to scripture, it took place at the beginning of this period. Fifty days after Christ's resurrection came the Feast of Weeks, which is known in Greek as Pentecost, meaning 50. It was on this day, in the fulfillment of the feast, that God first poured out the Holy Spirit in the upper room in Jerusalem. It's important to note that Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as living water that could be poured out abundantly. Just as the Genesis account of day 5 says, Let waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. For example, in John chapter 7 verses 37 and 39 it says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the scripture, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Also in John chapter 4 verse 14 it says, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, for the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The similarity of these texts in the New Testament when compared to Genesis gives this theory so much weight, and we see later on in the New Testament how the Holy Spirit is poured out abundantly as shown in Acts. It says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. We also see throughout the 5th millennium that Christianity exploded across the entire globe, reaching all corners of the earth. That is a miracle in and of itself, but the fact that it might have been foretold in Genesis is even more astonishing. Next we come to day 6, and this is where the theory attempts to explain the near future. Genesis chapter 1 verse 25 reads, And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. It continues in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. The key phrases here are, And God made the beast, and God created man, and said, Subdue it, and have dominion over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. According to this theory, the most important event to occur during Earth's sixth millennium will be the reign of the Antichrist, which is expected to come just before Jesus' return and his judgment upon the earth. And this is believed to occur during the final seven years of this millennium, in the year 5993, since God created the earth, 
or since he enacted this prophetic calendar, which according to the math would take place in the year 2023 and end in 2030, with the last three and a half years of that time frame being the Great Tribulation. Now I'm not for setting dates, and I wouldn't be surprised if 2023 came and went and Jesus did not return, because there have been many calendars that have predicted when he would come. But let's take a closer look at this theory and see how it stands up. Now first let's look at who is the Antichrist. The Bible says the Antichrist will be a man likened unto a beast, with the number 666, who will eventually be given power over all people, tongues, and nations. Revelation chapter 13 verse 18 reads, Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And now in Revelation chapter 13 verse 7 it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And finally in Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 and 17 it says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So day six is the day that God made the beast and man, and he told man to subdue everything on earth. Basically, the prophetic interpretation is believed to have foretold that during the earth's sixth millennium, a man, who is also referred to as the beast, will subdue all peoples of the earth, and that man is the Antichrist. This is also the day, according to the creation account, when God concludes his work, perhaps foretelling mankind would labor under sin's curse for 6,000 years until Christ would return and set up his millennial Sabbath kingdom. Those who adhere to this theory provide several scriptures that provide witness to this, including Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 and 2. It says, After six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John up unto a high mountain, and he was transfigured into a glowing white spirit body in front of them. So perhaps this foretells that after six days, or six thousand years, we will all see Jesus coming into the clouds of glory, glowing as a white spirit body, just as Jesus did. Also, it's important to note that we're told in the last days it'll be likened to the days of Noah, so by using the Noah account, we can draw some conclusions. For example, the flood struck when Noah was 600 years old. This may foretell when planet Earth is 6,000 years old, a global flood will come again, but this time by fire. It is widely believed that scripture tells us that the story of Noah, the ark, and the flood is a prophetic picture of the day of Christ's return. One house of righteous people will rise up into the air in what is known as the rapture, like Noah's family rose up in the ark above the water as a world of unrepentant people suffered God's judgment and died below. And finally we come to day 7. Genesis reads, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. The key phrases here are God ended his work which he had made, he rested on the seventh day, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. According to the prophetic calendar, the most important event to occur during Earth's seventh millennium will be the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, whereby Jesus rules here on Earth for a thousand years with all resurrected saints. Scripture says this period will begin immediately after Christ's return, and according to the prophetic theory, in the year 6000, when Satan is locked up in the bottomless pit. It will be a thousand years of rest and holiness on earth, without any of the effects of sin or death, and the Spirit of God will endure as he was meant to. In Revelation chapter 20 verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Also in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 9 through 11, it says, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. You see, just as God ended his work and rested on the seventh day, so too mankind and the earth will rest from the sin and death that has plagued it for so long. And after six thousand years it will come to perfection as God intended it to be. An amazing prophecy that brings this entire theory together comes from the oldest book in the Bible. Job, which says, He will deliver you from six troubles, in seven no evil shall touch you. Could this be referring to the six millenniums that mankind must trouble in before being delivered by God in the seventh millennium? Also in Leviticus, God commanded the Israelites to rest the land, or the earth, every seventh year. They were to work the land for six years, but the seventh was to be a Sabbath rest for the land, again providing a prophetic glimpse into God's providential plan for his people. And finally, we see a comparison in the story of Jacob and his bride in Genesis chapter 29, verse 20, 
We see that Jacob worked seven years for his bride. This foretold that Jesus will also work leading many to repentance for seven days or seven thousand years until he receives his final righteous bride which we know from scripture is the church as read in Revelation chapter 19 verses 7 and 8 it says let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready fine linen bright and clean was given her to wear I will admit it's a remarkable theory and only time will tell whether it's valid and from God as a Christian I know we're told no one will know the day or hour which is why I approach this theory with caution and we can't put too much faith in one theory do I believe it's true? There are a lot of assumptions that go into it, but there's also a lot of biblical passages that seem to confirm the theory. I think I want it to be true, because that would mean that our generation will witness the most amazing event to ever take place in human history, the return of Jesus. As I write these words in my chair surrounded by the pines of northern Arizona, I'm drawn to a sudden whisper of the trees, swaying together like an orchestra as if they're singing God's praises. Are they, in some cosmic sense, giving me the answer I'm looking for? I don't know, but it does remind me of the words of Paul in Romans chapter 1 verse 20. It says, For his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. All we can do is ensure we are ready to enter into God's rest. And that means we understand our fallen condition as sinners and that we come to Christ with a repentant heart, put our faith in Him as our Lord and Savior, and let Him put a work in us and we'll be born again as new creations in Christ Jesus, the perfect Son of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you and God bless.